So I want to thank the Indiana Poor People's Campaign. I want to thank Michael Spath. I want to thank Plymouth Church and everybody that's a part of the Center for Middle East Peace um, for this invitation and for this conference. Um, and I want to speak to you all about earth justice, economic justice, racial justice, and peace justice, and what I believe it's going to take for us to realize that. As some of you might know, the last campaign that Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was building was the Poor People's Campaign. Back in 1967 and 68, he proposed that uniting and organizing thousands of poor people from all across the country into a force to be reckoned with would be the Achilles heel, the weak point of a system of racism and poverty and militarism. And he said that we needed to unite millions of poor people across race and geography and issue into a campaign to lift the load of poverty. He came out with the Poor People's Campaign right when he came out against the war in Vietnam. And he said that all war, including that war, was an enemy of the poor. And that it would take pulling poor people together to stop this cruel manipulation of the poor. Shortly before he was killed, he shared some remarks that I think are really appropriate for Earth Day. As a Christian preacher, he said, God has left enough and to spare in this world for all his children to have the basic necessities of life. God never intended for some of his children to live in inordinate superfluous wealth while others live in abject, deadening poverty. And somehow I believe that God made it all. I believe firmly that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. I don't think it belongs to Mr. Rockefeller. I don't think it belongs to Mr. Ford. I think the earth is the Lord's. And since we didn't make these things by ourselves, we must share them with others. I think this is the only way we are going to solve the basic problems, the restructuring of our society, which I think is so desperately needed. Now today, in 2022, if we were to exchange Mr. Musk and Mr. Bezos for Mr. Rockefeller and Mr. Ford, although a little controversial, these words seem to really fit. If we look at what's going on, there are 140 million people who are poor and low income, nearly 100 million without health care or adequate health care, tens of millions on the verge of eviction, extreme storms wreaking havoc on lives and livelihoods, a growing Christian nationalist movement in this the richest country in human history. A report by the Institute for Policy Studies and the Americans for Tax Fairness put it this way. Never before has America seen such an accumulation of wealth in so few of hands, as tens of millions of Americans suffer from the health and economic ravages of this pandemic, a few hundred billionaires add to their massive fortunes. Yet, in the course of COVID-19, more than 8 million people have fallen into poverty. Child tax credit payments have stopped. Welfare monies are going unspent as families are continuing to suffer. And consider the fact that on top of all of this, on top of all of this, there are 39 million workers making less than a living wage, 14 million families who can't afford water, 
The nation has spent $21 trillion on war, deportation, detention, mass incarceration, and militarization of our community since 9-11, but won't find another one or two trillion dollars over the course of 10 years to invest in childcare and healthcare and climate resilient jobs and other economic investments in our community. This and so much more is why Dr. King's vision of building a beloved community is so prescient. And this, I would say, is why we need and are building a Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. From tens of thousands of families whose water has been shut off in Detroit, to those whose family members have died because of the lack of health care and Medicaid expansion in Vermont and Pennsylvania and North Carolina and Alabama, to thousands of immigrants crying out for hugs, not walls, at the U.S.-Mexico border, to families in Lowndes County and other rural communities across the country who have raw sewage in their yards, tropical diseases that had been eradicated, coming back and coming back strong, to hundreds of thousands, really millions of people whose votes have been suppressed because of racist gerrymandering, the ending of early voting and same-day registration, the closing of polling places, to homeless encampments under attack in Washington State and Oregon and my own state of New York, there is a cry. We want to be free. We need a moral revival to make this country great for so many whom it has never been. There's a moral movement afoot in this country with poor people in the lead. And we know from history when those most impacted by injustice band together with moral leaders and clergy and activists and people of conscience and people of faith and people not of faith, that is when change happens. That's when a nation, a world, gets better for everyone, not just a select few. So we launched the Poor People's Campaign five years ago with an understanding that we must simultaneously address five interlocking injustices. Systemic racism, ecological devastation, systemic poverty, the war economy, and this distorted moral narrative of religious nationalism. And we have said that if we don't resolve all of these injustices, we can't resolve any one of them. We have to resolve all of them together in an intersectional movement. And we can see many of these different manifestations here in Indiana. The pandemic of COVID-19 actually is a stark example. COVID has revealed its worsened deeper and broader economic and social emergencies that we've been confronting for many years. Emergencies caused by the lack of health care, the lack of affordable housing, living wages, labor rights, voting rights, environmental protections. Emergencies caused by war and police violence, a criminal justice injustice system and policy violence that kills us all. For years, poor and dispossessed people, people of faith and conscience, teachers, organizers, activists have been ringing the alarm on these emergencies offering solutions, taking direct action. But in response, those in positions of political and economic and moral authority have committed the crime denounced by prophets throughout the ages. As Jeremiah 6 tells us, they have treated the wounds of my people as if they were not serious, saying peace, peace when there is no peace. Echoing Jeremiah's accusation of those who cry peace when there is no peace, the prophet Ezekiel compares society, worlds that address or fail to address public health crises or climate crises or the crisis of an impoverished democracy 
to covering a flimsy wall with plaster. Ezekiel 13 says, I will throw down the wall that you dabbed with plaster. I will raise it to the ground so that its foundations is exposed. When it falls, you shall per perish in the midst, then you shall know that I am the Lord. This is the truth of pandemics of disasters in the Bible, including plagues. They tear down the flimsy, whitewashed walls of false narratives to expose foundations of injustice. Before such pandemics, God always sends prophets, often sick and poor people themselves, to tell the powerful to reject wickedness, to stop oppressing the poor, to turn toward justice. But when that vision, that action isn't enough, when the powerful double down on inequality and violence and exploitation, that's when we see plagues. The Poor People's Campaign just uh, announced, just launched a, a, a study, a report. It's been issued by us and the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. And it's called the Poor People's Pandemic Report. It connects data about COVID deaths at a county le level and looks at other demographic information at the same time. And what we show in this report is that poor counties all across this country, including here in Indiana, have experienced twice the number of deaths from COVID-19 as higher ones, and up to five times at the deadliest waves of COVID. Indeed, COVID, because of the pre-existing conditions of racism and poverty and low wages and the lack of health care, is a poor people's pandemic, exposes the depth of racism and poverty and ecological devastation that preceded and has only been worsened through this pandemic. Over the past couple of years, we've heard many stories, story after story about how COVID-19 is a great equalizer. That how pandemics, plagues, they don't discriminate. But this report shows that maybe a virus can't discriminate but our society does it all the time. It should be a wake-up call for a society that has become accustomed to death, especially when it's the death of poor people. And, and what's important about this report is it says that, that the devastation and death wrought by COVID isn't just about vaccine status. It's not just about culture wars. It's about the lack of health care. It's about poisoned water. It's about poverty and low wages. It's about the fact that we had 700 people a day dying from poverty and inequality in a country that throws out more food than it takes to feed everybody in this country and the world whole over. when we don't have a scarcity of resources, but we surely have a scarcity of political will and moral consciousness as a nation to address injustice. When we hold up this collective mirror, we see a nation that had 87 million people uninsured and underinsured. We see millions of workers that still have not seen a wage raise uh, despite being called now essential. Uh, they can't afford the essentials of life. We see a country that is okay somehow with 52% of our kids going to bed in homes that don't have enough food. Is it a surprise that then COVID has just wreaked this kind of havoc, disrupted people's lives? It's not. 
because people's lives don't seem to matter. But my message today is actually not about despair. It's about hope. Hope in hard times, hard places. It's about a movement that's building to change all of this. Because from Alaska to Alabama, from the Bronx to the border, people are actually coming together. Poor people's campaign leaders understand that we're at a critical juncture in this nation and that a movement has the potential to unite all of our struggles, reconstruct society from the ground up around the needs of everybody. Now, a lot of folks will, will say, well, you're just talking about idealism. Your demands are too ambitious. You're politically impossible and, and just too expensive. But this is just not true. The benefits of actually raising wages and providing health care and addressing child poverty and turning our war economy into a peace economy, guess what? Those costs, those costs are affordable. Child poverty cost the United States last year $1 trillion. Unstable housing cost $111 billion. The, the, the amount the government subsidizes for the low wages that corporations like Walmart and Amazon and Starbucks pay to their workers is, is $150 billion every year. But if our nation were to have a moral revolution of values and put the needs and demands of the poor, the planet, at the center of our budget, guess what? Then this would redound to the benefit of everyone. If we raise the federal minimum wage to a living wage, we would have $400 billion in our communities right now, circulating, helping small businesses, helping communities, helping schools, helping libraries. If we had a, a more fair taxation system, we'd have $866 billion more a year to spend on the kinds of things that matter to our communities. If we actually invested in climate resilient jobs and a clean energy transition, not only do we save $7 on the dollar to military jobs, it would just come back and build and, and, and mean our society would be healthier and happier. In this, the richest country in the world, we have the resources. And we know this from social science and from the statistics that I'm saying, but we also know it from the Bible. Deuteronomy says that if we forgive debts and we increase programs of social uplift, if we pay workers a living wage, and if we release those oppressed and enslaved to oppression and poverty, and when we lend out money that we might never see again, guess what? Your society flourishes. Now that's not what we hear in these yet to be United States, but it is the case. God does not ordain poverty. The poor will only be with us as long as we're being disobedient to a system and a society of justice. Poverty is a people's creation. It's a creation of moral budgets, unjust policies, and so we have the power to choose to end it. And so let's talk a little bit about that power. I want to tell you about some of the folks that are building this work. In Flint and Detroit, Michigan, there are folks that have been organizing for water affordability who put year after year after year the crisis of leaded water on the map. And guess what? because of their organizing, not just the pundits, not just the media makers, not just the politicians, because of poor moms in Flint and Detroit, $15 billion are gonna make sure that across this country there's no more lead pipes. That's the power of poor people. That's the power of organizing. That's the power of movement. In Oak Flat, Arizona, 
The Apache stronghold there is fighting a multinational copper uh, plant and, and corporation. But they've been able to win the alliance, the support of people, indigenous tribes, and other folks from across the country and world. And now, if they destroy the most sacred land of the Apache people, they will have to do so with the whole world watching. And that itself is a victory. In Union Hill, Virginia, in Memphis, Tennessee, community leaders, poor folk, were able to come together, band together, organize incredible campaigns against pipelines, the Atlantic Pipeline, the Bahalia Pipeline. And they connected up with Buddhists and Christians and Jews and said, we are not going to allow our environment to be degraded and for poor people's lives to be sacrificed on an altar of greed. And guess what? They blocked both of those pipelines, despite the fossil fuel companies pouring in billions and billions of dollars, the power of poor people organizing. That has changed things. And in Cancer Alley, Louisiana, there are hundreds of petrochemical companies that inhabit that strip all the way from New Orleans to Baton Rouge. They have some of the highest rates of cancer in the entire country. But leaders from Rye St. James, folks with the Louisiana Poor People's Campaign, they've been able to stop the further development of co chemical companies coming in. And in their organizing, in their protesting, they sing out, victory is mine. Victory is mine. We told Formosa, we told Exxon, we told BP to get thee behind because victory today is mine. So these victories, these stories of communities coming together, banding together, and putting forward a, a vision of earth justice, of economic justice, of racial justice, of global justice, these are the communities that will be highlighted when the Poor People's Campaign gathers in June in Washington, D.C for a mass poor people and low wage workers assembly, a moral march on Washington and to the polls. This, this moment means that we have to come together. We need to declare, as Patty sang with us, that somebody's been hurting our people. Somebody's been poisoning the water. Somebody's been evicting our families. Somebody's been destroying the earth. And it's gone on far too long. It's gone on far too long. It's gone on far too long. And we won't be silent anymore. So I want everybody here to consider joining us in Washington, DC. If you've been to DC for protests before, bring some more folks. If you've never thought about getting on a bus and, and driving from Fort Wayne, Indiana to Washington, DC, you should be there in the numbers as the saints go marching in because we say it's time to declare that life overcomes death. And it is in our power. If, if we live in 2022 and there's folks who are struggling with environmental degradation and militarism and poverty and racism, it is our responsibility. It is our duty to each other to come together and to organize. And so I hope you all will join us in June. I hope that you'll get involved in the Poor People's Campaign here in Indiana. I hope you'll continue to build the Center for Middle East Peace and continue to, to learn about all of these issues and how they, how they connect and intersect and how they do not have to be. We can indeed save the planet and everything living in and on it. And we can do so because those who have come before and the future generations that will come after are depending on us. So thank you.
Well, wow. We have time for some questions. And we have Linda with the microphone. So who would like to uh, start? Tony, please. Yes, um, Tony, wait for the microphone, man. Thanks, Tony. That's a great question. He had the gist of that. Yeah. Yeah, so um, again, I, I know we're people of, of many different faiths here, but, but what that question and what that point brought, me, brought up for me was one of my favorite parables in the Bible. Um, and it's the parable of the persistent widow. And, and what it says in that story in Luke 19 is that they're in a certain town maybe it's Fort Wayne, was a judge, a political authority. <laughs> and they say that that judge, that political authority leader, didn't give a damn about other human beings and didn't even fear God. And so that political leader would pass policy after policy that just hurt the poor. But then there was this woman, this widow, who kept on coming and demanding justice, not just for her and her family, but for her community. And it says that, that she kept on coming. And, and one of the things that's kind of amazing to me about this parable is it says that the, the judge, the, the kind of political leader, it's not that he has a aha moment and realizes that he's been uh, doing the wrong thing the whole time. It's not that he all of a sudden is won over with a sense of, of justice and righteousness. But he says, I think this woman is going to keep on coming and coming. And she's going to give me a political black eye. And so what happens from that is because of the organizing of those that are most impacted, coming and coming, returning and returning, being persistent in, in the demand for justice, that justice is served. So it's not waiting for those that are gentrifying and developing housing developments or, or putting in forth uh, new business improvement districts. Uh, it's not those folk that are going to come up with the solutions to, to the problems our society is facing. It's when people, like all of us that are gathered here today, come together and keep on insisting it does not have to be this way. And so to me, I go back to that parable all the time because I think it, it grounds us in a sense of how we can achieve change and how change has always been achieved. If we look uh, from, from abolition to, to the, the labor struggles of the, the 20s and 30s to, to what now is ha happening all across the country with Starbucks workers organizing, is that it's the persistence of those who are most impacted saying it does not have to be. Yes, John, please. John is the founder of the Center for Nonviolence here in town. I have awesome. two questions. The first one is a quick question. Um, I want to ask you to take 60 seconds to describe what the world will be like after your cause prevails. Okay. And that's my first question. My second question is a little more complex. I've been <laughs> Because that's simple. <laughs> John the idealist. <laughs> my second question arises out of my life experience. I'm 75, 74 years old. I realize when I turned 74, I'm no longer even a young 70. And I've spent my whole adult life struggle, being in the struggle, um, war resistance, peace. We started a Center for Nonviolence in Fort Wayne, premised on ending militarism, racism, homophobia, and domestic violence, and seeing the linkages between all of that and poverty. 
And there's, it, in the shadow place in my spirit, there's a voice now in the face of this Ukrainian invasion that says, I'm glad we have a military industrial complex to counter Putin. And I know that, I know that that voice is going to um, perhaps a predominant uh, philosophy in the United States. I know it's antithetical to everything I've ever stood for, but I need help from you to find language and vision to counter that voice in my own soul as well as in our community. Thank you, John. Yeah, so I would say neither of those questions are simple. <laughs> um, but I, I deeply appreciate both. Um, so I might take up the question of, of war uh, first. Um, I was really appalled this week to read in the Wall Street Journal that, the, that they, the editorial board of the Wall Street Journal, was arguing to double the US military budget when we have the largest military budget this year already uh, with 30 million in it that the Pentagon didn't even ask for. And what I do know from looking, and I'm sure you know this better um, and, and have more of the analysis and understanding, but I do know that war in all its forms is an enemy of the poor everywhere. Um, and so that that, if we get to 1.6 trillion of a military budget, if, if the Wall Street Journal wins, um, we know that that means you know, no relief for student debt. That means no expanded health care. We know it means you know, wage raises for people. It means no expanded health care. And, and it's not that we can't afford those things, but uh, our society tends to, tends to uh, prefer and, and defer to the military industrial complex. Um, we also know that, that the people of Russia and the people of the Ukraine are devastated and being further devastated right now by this war. And I, th I think it is hard to think about how do you stop a Christian nationalist and, and kind of demagogue in Putin. Um, but also how do we see a world that, that, does not, that does not move towards the kind of nuclear annihilation that we have never been closer to. And, and, and the fact that you know, they have these new weapons and Russia is threatening to use them that can destroy, nuclearly annihilate a place the size of Texas or multiple Indianas together. Um, that, and that the counter to that uh, is, is to build up the arms race more. It, it does not make us any safer. Um, and so, you know, what, what has always been needed for, for peace is for people in societies to, to come together and, and advocate for it. Uh, and people are doing that in Russia, people are doing that in the Ukraine, people are doing that across the world, and uh, because of years and years of the kind of degradation of life in this country and around the world, it, it I fear for where we're headed. Um, and, and yes, being able to arm and, and further you know, send weapons throughout the world, you know, it's, it's kind of like going back to the Bible you know, uh, and, and Dr. King, and an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth until the world is blind. And so how do we kind of cease this kind of warring madness, I think is a question, but I also think it's directly connected to everything we're talking about at this conference today, which is, is it, it requires people 
in our communities across this country and across the world to, to seek peace and work for justice. And, uh, and so I, I, I'm, I'm terrified about uh, the situation of the world right now. And I mourn every day for the people of Ukraine and, and the people in Russia whose, whose name this war is being fought out in. Um, and, and I know that just like the peace movement in this country has, has often said, not in our name, um, there are just so many folks that are resisting the kind of drive to war all over the world. Um, and if we don't kind of see the connection to oil and fossil fuels and, and, and wealth and greed, and if we don't see this kind of Christian nationalistic project that Putin has, um, uh, and see how it's connected to Donald Trump and to the project that, that he has. And, and, and it's not like a simple solution, um, but, but, but military solutions are also not the solution. Um, and and I, I think we, we are seeing that uh, right now. And so, you know, then to the, think a little bit about what, what's the world going to look like when we are able to build this powerful enough movement, I think there's ways that we can't even fully imagine it, but I do see glimpses of, of that in the kind of resistance that people are doing in Russia, in Ukraine to war, in the kind of mutual solidarity feeding that people are doing in this country, in you know people coming together across all the lines that divide us, um, and and you know, actually uh, finding common cause amongst each other. Um, and, and so I, I can't, in 60 seconds, you know, point out what that world will be, but I, I've definitely uh, seen, you know, from the hills to the hollers of West Virginia when I was marching there last week, this, this kind of moral movement um, where people of great diversity who, you know, we're told on the TV have nothing in common are finding that we actually are united. Uh, that might be what King's beloved community was. Uh, it might be what the kind of church and community that I found amongst people organizing, poor folk organizing in this country is. And, and I think it's a, a kind of a dream um, that, 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 we, that we can achieve. But, but uh, only if we if we kind of come together um, in the way that I, I see people coming together, and and so, you know, I, I'll be curious to hear uh, examples that people have here. I'm sure there are many of of little microcosms of of that kind of uh, as the Bible calls it jubilee, um, where people um, you know come together and and proclaim that that life is sacred and that we can take care of each other and, and keep on going from there. Another question. Yes, sir. Timothy, please. We've got a microphone coming over for you. Yeah. Linda's running. Our, our host pastor. Thanks. Yeah. Um, as you said earlier, the Poor People's Campaign was uh, restarted in 2017, so it's been uh, five years of, of work, and, and as many know, there in 2018, there was the uh, big push in probably 35, 40 state capitals with six weeks of direct action, civil disobedience, and so forth. And mm -hmm. I'm just curious of uh, what are the hopes of, um, uh, for a, a national mobilization Yeah, I mean, so so indeed, the the Poor People's Campaign launched with the largest and most expansive wave of nonviolent civil disobedience in the 21st century, and and the way it was done in about 40 state capitals, 35, 40, um, like you said, was 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 never done in U.S. history before. Um, and what that did was seed these coordinating committees in about 40 states. Um, uh, pretty soon, will be all 50 states um, of impacted folks and and 
clergy and activists and advocates who, who, who now thousands of people wake up every day trying to think about how do we build a moral movement from the ground up. And, you know, I, we had had plans in 2020 before the pandemic hit to, to have basically the assembly in March that we're planning now. Um, and we had to move it online. And, and we had, you know, there the, the largest online gathering of poor and low-income people. Uh, we had about three million people join. Um, and folks got to see, you know, people like themselves and not, nothing like themselves, um, all kind of coming forward with, with their stories and their solutions to, to the problems that are plaguing society. Um, but it's not the same to do that online. It's not the same to, to watch that, you know, on your computer or on your phone, you know, whether at a homeless encampment or in the, the comforts of a, a, a beautiful house. Um, but, and, and for those in power to, to see that people are, are organizing and coming together and, and actually building something, you know, big and powerful. So I think the hopes is that when we look at, at history, there haven't been movements of, of transforming transformational change that have not included what is often understood as kind of generationally transformative mobilizations and events. So it's not to say that, that all of the work is about, you know, going to, to one event. Um, and, and we're very clear that, that this is not like a, a day, it's a kind of declaration of the kind of power that's building. Um, but also, when you pull people together and you have folks from every state and you have you know, folks that are, are without health care or without water, but also folks that, that uh, have lots of resources, but, but see that, that uh, it's just not right to, to have society the way it is, um, and, and to pull people together and, and to, to, to kind of you know, declare um, uh, that, that, that we're, we're going to keep on building this. I mean, again, if we, if we look at, at other moments in history, but then also, you know, in our in our lives today, um, that kind of building up of power and changing the narrative is what it takes to to be able to to keep on uh, kind of building for change. And you know, a favorite quote of mine from Dr. King is is uh, that um, power uh, for poor people will really mean having the assertiveness, the aggressiveness and the ability to make uh, those in power say yes when they may be desirous of saying no. And I think over the last couple of years, over the last couple of decades, we've gotten used to a lot of no. Um, no, we can't raise wages. No, we can't cut the military budget. No, we can't expel health care in, in a public health crisis. No, you know, we can't, uh, we can't allow for kids to get a child tax credit uh, without their parents working, you know, crap jobs. Um, but, but what it takes is to kind of come together and declare yes. Um, and uh, again, it's not waiting um, for those in power to do the right thing, but instead, you know, showing that, as we've been saying on this mobilization tour that we're on, you know, we are ready, we're ready. We're ready for a change. We're ready, we're ready, we're ready. Here we come. And so, you know, Washington, D.C., Congress, um, the White House, here we come. We have time for a couple uh, more brief questions. Yeah, please, Jan. Thanks. Um, it's been a while ago, but I watched a video where Barbara, I think you and several others were in front of members of Congress. And um, you, you even had a budget. You had it all figured out how this would be budgeted and it would come out and we could do this. And I just felt like they could well, they were listening politely, but they really didn't do it right. Um, how did you feel about that? And is that part of your plan again? Yeah, so, so in a number of different situations, uh, the Poor People's Campaign has, has been able to do these congressional hearings. I think the one you're talking about is when we kind of marched into the House Budget Committee and presented our Poor People's Moral Budget. Um, 
And what we said was, you know, if we enacted a fair taxation system, if we cut the military budget in half, and if we invested in programs of, of health care and social uplift and, and uh, you know, investments around water and, and infrastructure, all of this, um, that indeed we could, we could achieve everything on our agenda and, and, and more. Um, and, and it was to me really fascinating, I mean, not, not in a happy way, but really interesting to see the response. I mean, so the, the, first, um, the first kind of answer was, uh, was to join the military that the, the best way of addressing poverty and, and low wages and poor poverty in, in communities um, was for, for folks to, to join the military. And, and that was, I mean, not shocking. We, we basically don't have a draft, but we have a poverty draft. Already, much of the way that, that poor folk are able to you know, go to college or, or, or get provided for, for their families um, because of the lack of living wage jobs is, is that many poor people enlist. Um, uh, but it's it's but then if we look at the the statistics and the figures, you know, uh, many folks in the military are so poor that their families have to rely on on you know public assistance. And 40% of adults who are homeless are veterans. Um, so clearly, we don't actually uh, clearly the military for lots of reasons is not a path to getting out of poverty. Um, the, the, the next kind of thing that was thrown at us was that, you know, if people just, um, you know, worked harder and kind of prayed more, um, then, then, you know, then everything would be okay. And, and, and you know, one of the highlights of, of that hearing, and I actually encourage folks, uh, you, you can find it and I could send it around too, because um, it's, it's a really interesting study in kind of the, the mental terrain of many of our elected officials. So you had um, this this representative from Ohio, not Indiana, but but maybe close enough. Um, you know, say uh, to us, including Reverend Barbara and myself, who are wearing these stoles and and wearing our clerical garb. Um, you know that he's read the Bible, and he considers him a Christian, himself a Christian. And that nowhere in the Bible that he's read does he see anywhere where Jesus says to Caesar to help the poor. So Ron Barber's response was immediate and awesome, where he says, well, I think it's really interesting that as a Christian, you're aligning yourself with Caesar. Um, <laughs> You're basically articulating some a reality that I'm sure you believe, but but most people in power don't really admit to. Um, but and and then he kind of passed it to me, and I said, you know, should we actually look at the Bible a little bit in terms of all the places that Jesus says to Caesar and to the ruling authorities um, of the Roman Empire, um, not of Jewish synagogues, but of of the empire uh, that indeed. Uh, when you neglect to feed and clothe and house me, then uh, that you're doing that to God. That when, uh, uh, you know, the spirit of a God is upon me, he has anointed me to pre preach good news, um, uh, not the bad news of eviction and, and cutting of programs to the Patokos, those made poor by policy and justice, um, and just like, you know, continued on and on and on, right? But it, but it was so interesting that, that most of these representatives on both sides of the aisle had to admit that they were aware of the level of poverty in their communities. Um, uh, but, but instead, as, as a bunch of the folks that were with us who are low-wage workers who said, you know, if I did that bad of a job at my employment, I would be fired. Like you just admitted that all of these people in your constituency, you know, don't have living wages, don't have health care, and, and you're just fine with that. Um, you know, like if I don't flip the burger right, I get lose my job. But but you seem to be able to, you know, thrive in this position. But but despite people being aware, despite having these arguments of, of the military industrial complex and, and theology, bad theology being the way out that that was what they had to fall back on, 
which to me shows the strength of a movement and of the arguments and of the budget that we were presenting. Because if, if you have to fall back on these tired old stereotypes and inaccuracies and theoretical theologies, and you can't just actually say, um, we don't want to do it, <laughs> which might be what's happening, then you have, you have the potential to, to change things, right? Because, because it's not just, as Dr. Barber often says, you know, the right thing to do, but it's con constitutionally consistent, economically sane, and, and morally consistent to, 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 to do this. And, and so we're not talking about some radical ideas out there. We're talking about you know, how do we save the heart and soul of, of the nation and of the democracy and, 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 and for those in power to, to then know about these issues um, and then to shy away just means that we have to keep coming back and coming back, which, which we surely intend to do. Yes, indeed, <laughs> in that bus. We do have time for one last question, if there's a question out there. Yes, please, Jorge. Um, what, uh, thank you so much for coming. Wait for, wait for the microphone, would you, Jorge? Thank you so much for coming to Fort Wayne. Um, my question is, uh, what is, uh, how do you go about, if, if you are in a position to, um, where you're faced with, like, challenges that are beyond your own kind of purview or your own authority? I mean, we often see with elected officials where they have authority over a certain part, but they can't affect something else. I mean, for example, the Puerto Rico ruling, like, a them judging, them judging on Puerto Rican being treated, you know, differently, and it's like what the law says, you know, versus the law being unjust, how to deal with that. Um, you know, what, what are your thoughts on, on you know, uh, officials and, and, and people that are in a position where uh, they feel they have to, they're, they have to morally compromise because of what's legally expected versus, you know, what they think should be. Yeah, so I think it's it's really important for us to kind of recognize that that poverty and injustice in many manifestations are completely legal in our system, right? Um, but they have been before, and 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 that means that it becomes our duty to to resist and organize unjust legal systems and legislation, right? Um, so again, Dr. King is really good on this and especially the kind of steps of nonviolent direct action and civil disobedience. Um, you know, the, it, it's about, it's it, it steps, right? It, I mean, so it's not just taking an action one, one time, it's, it's identifying um, the, 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 the problem that you're trying to solve, who has the authority to do something about it, and then continuing to, to both give people a chance to, to, to do the right thing, um, but then being willing to put yourself out there um, in direct action, in civil disobedience, in protest of, of many forms. It doesn't have to be breaking the law, but to kind of show the inconsistency and the unjustness of, of, of laws, right? And so, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the points that Dr. King makes a lot of the time is that, you know, uh, it was illegal um, in the Holocaust um, in, in Germany under Hitler uh, to aid and abet Jewish folk, you know, you know getting to, to life and freedom. Um, just like in abolition in this country, it was illegal to help um, those enslaved that were running towards freedom. Um, but it, it doesn't mean that it was right. Um, and so sometimes things are legal and wrong. And so the fact that if I come out of a homeless movement, um, and, and one of the contradictions we would raise all the time was that it's perfectly legal to be homeless in the society. When you get illegal is when you decide to move back into houses that you've been evicted from. Um, but moving back into that house 
Might be illegal, but it means I'm going to live. Um, but staying legal might mean that you're going to die. Um, and so it, 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 to me, kind of brings us back to the place. And, and we all have different roles to play, and we all have different ways, and we need multiple ways of, of, of kind of challenging the justness um, of, of laws and legislation. But, but, but to be able to say, and, and not direct it just at that police officer or law enforcement, or, or even at, at you know, any individual in the political system or legal system, but, but to see that it's a whole structure and that that structure needs to be transformed and changed. Um, and so, for instance, when we do nonviolent civil disobedience, we're very clear that we're trying to welcome the police officers who are going to arrest us you know, into the movement because most of them aren't wake, making living wages. Many of them don't have the kind of health care for their families. And, you know, and, 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 and they're just doing what, what they're supposed to do. Um, but it also is clear to us that, that staying silent about unjust laws um, is not an option either, right? And so you can do that in a way where you challenge the justness of, uh, you know, of, of law and legislation, and at the same time, um, you know, don't, uh, you know, build a division between you and that, and that person um, when it's really a larger structural problem. Let's say thanks to Reverend Liz for uh,